They have no natural predators. Common and grey seals haven't been hunted in Germany for around 50 years. These days, it's the people protecting the seals who are called seal hunters. One of them's Rolf Bledel from Heligoland. Once again, his help's needed. An animal has got tangled in an old net. Uh, ganz ruhig. Oh, so was stramm rum, eh? Ganz ruhig. Uh, hey. ich dir doch the seal wouldn't stand a chance without Rolf Bledel. So, how up? More and more plastic waste in our oceans is threatening the fauna and, ultimately, us. It's terrible. Why can't we just bring it back to land and dispose of it in the correct way? research into the extent of the plastic threat will take us all over northern Germany. We start in Heligoland. Seal hunter Rolf Bledel has known most of his charges since birth. He's happy to introduce them to tourists. The one on the right is a common seal. So is the next one. Then a grey seal. Common seal, grey seal, common seal. The best and most impressive experience for me was this seal that lay down in front of me in the dunes. It had this plastic band around its head, the kind you tie newspapers up with, and it was cutting into the animal's shoulder. I got out my knife and cut it loose and carefully removed it from the wound. It didn't flinch or anything. It looked at me and then it left. We get animals with nets around their necks a fair bit here. Heligoland isn't just a paradise for seals, it's also Germany's only breeding site for ocean-going birds. Several species come here to breed from April onwards, such as gannets, which are the size of geese. The birds use anything floating on the water to make their nests. More and more often, that means plastic waste, especially discarded fishing nets. But if the birds get tangled up in it, it's unlikely they'll get free. One bird lover is Wolfgang Schlegel. He's been documenting the dramatic events on his website, Gannett Cemetery. It takes them three or four days to die. My wife always calls me crazy for taking pictures of this, but I feel I need to show it to the world, otherwise nothing will get done. Ornithologists are also concerned about what's happening on the cliffs. Jochen Dierschke from Heligoland's ornithological station explains why it's not possible to help the birds. If you were to climb over there, you'd probably cause some rocks to fall, which would ruin more nests or kill more birds than you'd be helping, so it's pointless. It's rare that bird lovers can intervene and free the animals from the plastic waste. This gannet is already so weak that it probably won't survive. The problem isn't limited to the breeding birds. Fish also get tangled up in these discarded nets. Gannets swoop down from a great height. If they're lucky, it's not a big problem, but often it kills them because the net becomes tangled around their beaks and then they can't eat anymore. There are other breeding birds on Heligoland, such as fulmers, which are easily mistaken for seagulls. They spend almost their whole lives out at sea. For this reason, scientists have chosen them as the indicator for the plastic contamination of the seas. It's a contamination with serious consequences for the animals.
scientists like biologist Niels Guza from Boosum regularly meet on the Dutch island of Texel. He's participating in an international research project that's documenting the long-term build-up of waste in the North Sea. He studies fulmars that are washed up dead. These birds are complete omnivores. They eat fish, squid, zooplankton, but also cadavers and waste discarded by fishing boats. Up until a few decades ago, they didn't have to be very selective. Most of the things on the surface of the sea were suitable for them to eat. They can't tell the difference, so they eat the plastic waste just as they would eat their food. We met Niels Guza for the first time on Texel in 2008. The scientists are still collecting fulmars that have been washed up dead. Every year they meet in the Imares Research Center on Texel in order to examine the animals. Despite steadily increasing environmental protection measures, the amount of rubbish in birds' stomachs has risen. This bird ate so much plastic that it starved in spite of a full stomach. We find plastic waste in more than 90% of the animals. We currently get an average of around 300 milligrams per bird. Depending on the kind of plastic waste, it can have different effects. If it's a larger piece or foil, which blocks up the gastrointestinal tract, then food can't get through anymore. If it's sharp, it can damage the lining of the stomach. The larger the birds, the larger the pieces of plastic. The problem can be found everywhere, from Heligoland to Hawaii. This pile of refuse has come from the stomachs of two albatrosses. Toxins on and in the plastic also cause problems for the birds. When it comes to chemicals, plastics are like a sponge. Oil and persistent organic pollutants can build up in the plastic, causing the birds to poison themselves indirectly. And not just birds. All creatures living in the water are at risk now. However, nobody knows as yet how bad the pollution really is. Scientists from the Alfred Wegener Institute are working on Heligoland to create a plastic waste inventory of the North Sea and the Baltic. This catamaran will be dragged through the water of Heligoland by the smallest vessel in the Institute's fleet. The scientists want to find out whether plastic has entered the food chain and, if yes, how far up it has already gone. The Ada is a small wooden vessel that used to transport tourists to and from the island. Now it fishes plastic waste out of the sea. Under the microscope, plastic particles measuring around half a millimetre can be detected quite well. Martin Lerder instantly finds some particles that are most likely fragments of something larger. The scientists believe they'll find very much more if they look for even smaller particles. We're right in the beginning. The most important thing, the main focus of our project, is to come up with realistic figures about how much plastic is out there. Next morning, in the harbour on Heligoland, the Uthorn is setting off. The scientists from the Alfred Wegener Institute want to catch fish and examine their organs for traces of microplastics. The crew are using a trawl net which is dragged over the floor of the North Sea. The water is around 50 metres deep here. After an hour, they have their first haul. Plastic waste has also become tangled on the nets and lines. That's an old rubbish bag or a piece of tarpaulin. That was on the seafloor because it's covered in barnacles. 
This is what the seafloor looks like around here. The net contains many starfish, mussels, fish and some crabs, as well as the omnipresent plastic waste. Sometimes the animals can be covered in plastic, almost unable to move. It's frustrating, particularly when we always collect the rubbish and make sure nothing goes into the sea. But we still keep finding it in our nets. This is what they already know. The scientists find an average of 10 kilograms of plastic waste per square kilometer in their nets. That was the result of evaluations of earlier research trips. Now they want to know whether the refuse has made its way into the food chain. That's why these mackerel will be examined for traces of microplastics. The small island of Melum is situated 55 kilometers further south off the coast of East Frisia. It's uninhabited and a good example of what happens when islands are left to their own devices. There are no tourists and no officials here, just a few ornithologists. They're members of the Melum Council, which is run by volunteers. Once a week, they collect the rubbish on specified sections of the beach and document what was washed up. Over the course of 20 years, we've collected more than 54,000 pieces of rubbish on 13 sections. We've entered them all into a database to have a long-term understanding of changes through the introduction of deposits on returnable bottles, for example. This data is used because there are international treaties that forbid waste disposal at sea. How are you going to verify that it happens if not like this? They found that despite increased environmental protection measures, the amount of rubbish that's washed up hasn't decreased. And the percentage of plastic has gone up. Up to 90% of the washed up rubbish is plastic now. These mountains of rubbish are nowhere to be seen on the islands popular with holidaymakers. Could it be that the current carries the rubbish to Melum while avoiding other islands? Borkum is a case in point. Visitors from all over Germany come here for the fresh air and clean beaches. But Borkum lies by the shipping channel that connects Emden and the Ems with the major sea routes. Why isn't plastic waste an issue on Borkum? We learn the answer the following morning. Michael Greve and his colleague have been on refuse patrol since sunrise. They remove what the waves washed up the night before, before the first holidaymakers put down their towels. The efforts to keep the beaches clean are immense, and that's true for all Germany's beaches. But the costs involved in keeping them clean aren't recorded anywhere. On Borkum alone, there are seven beach wardens and several drivers who make sure that the four bathing beaches are clean during the holiday season. We've had car doors, old fridges, Styrofoam, which floats, of course, and washes up in small chunks. That's hard to collect. Kleinen Stücken auf dem Strand liegt nicht sehr schwer auszusortieren. When the bathing beaches are clean and time allows, the men clean the island's remaining coastline. The mountain of rubbish in this trailer is the result of two days' work. This was discarded by a ship. A diesel engine needed oil, and when the canister was empty, it was just thrown overboard. It's Texaco. We all know it didn't contain vegetable oil. Bestimmt kein Speiseöl. 
Between 1,000 and 5,000 pieces of rubbish are to be found per kilometre of untouched coastline. That's true for the entire southern section of the North Sea. Some holidaymakers turn the rubbish into bizarre works of art, but this is just the visible portion of the washed-up waste. Work continues because even if the beach looks clean, it really isn't. Attached to this tractor is the sales hit of a major German manufacturer of beach cleaning equipment. Once the large pieces of rubbish have been removed, the beach cleaner combs through the sand to gather up organic waste like seaweed and feathers, which is then turned into compost. That's done here in the Hedden Horticultural Centre. Before this waste can be composted, it has to be sifted. It's still full of large items. The only things that should be caught in the grid now are stones, shells and seaweed, but Wilhelm Hedden finds other things too. Those small buckets contain five to six hundred items. That's from the last two days. It's typical when they repair their nets, they throw what's left over into the sea. These lines contain 30, 40 threads, depending on how thick they are. And then they unravel. And all of these threads come apart. And that can be fatal for birds. And even this mightn't be all yet. The search for the extent of the plastic threat takes us to Spiekerorg, 60 kilometers further west. Professor Gerd Liebertzeit from the University of Oldenburg wants to know how clean the North Sea Island really is. His university is working with the Helmen Leet School, Speaker Org's island boarding school. What we're doing now is we'll mark one square meter and then sift everything through this wonderful bonsai sieve. We'll see what plastic gets stuck that's larger than five millimeters. We're also going to take a sample from what went through the sieve, and we're going to examine that in the lab for microplastics. <laughs> it's low tide. The sand the students are sifting is underwater at high tide. The sea has left the beach apparently clean. At first glance, the only things in the sieve are shells. But now the students take a closer look at the sifted sand. It's mixed with a salt solution. The sand sinks to the bottom. Everything that floats will be looked at in more detail. This is the yield from 50 grams of beach sand. These fine grains look like sand, but they're actually plastic. There are some fibers in the mix too. The students are given a new task. They're to get clothes made partially of polyester from their dorm rooms. The popular fleece jumpers are suspected of releasing plastic fibers. A brief wash at 40 degrees. The students catch the dirty water in a 10 litre bucket. This time, anything that's larger than one hundredth of a millimetre is filtered out. Hardly anything's getting through. The sieve is blocked because it contains so many fibres already. You could even detect individual colours. I've got blue, pink and red and individual crumbs. The professor has an idea about the round particles they found. He's bought some toothpastes and shower gels in one of the island's drugstores. They contain polyethylenes. Plastic. That's only written on the back and in very small print, of course. 
the products advertise with the power of nature. With green tea and cucumber extracts, calms the skin and won't dry it out, even with daily use. There you go, use it every day. It costs two euros fifty. The cosmetics are also put through a fine sieve. This is from a massage shower gel. This is the plastic percentage. We filtered almost the entire tube. Well, half the tube. That's how much plastic was in it. It's all plastic. It just looks like foam. If you dunk it in here, you can see the small beads. It's crazy. I wouldn't have thought that you'd be rubbing so much plastic into your skin. But the cosmetics manufacturers use the fine plastic granules to act as sandpaper, removing skin cells and plaque. We want to talk to the manufacturers about it, but almost all of them decline, apart from one. The cosmetics giant Unilever lets us look at the production process in its factory near Stade. They say they'll talk openly to us about plastic granules in cosmetics. The brands Dove and Axe are produced here. Unilever was the first company to announce it would voluntarily stop using plastic additives in its products from 2015 onwards. That's even though plastic has huge advantages for the manufacturers. It's easy to produce, fulfills all hygiene standards, and it's cheap. The requirements for cosmetics are high. The mix has to remain stable for 30 months, and the ingredients mustn't separate or change. Zara Schuderkopf is a manager in the personal care division for Germany, Austria, and Switzerland. I'm going to spread the product thinly on the glass plate to see the different particles. We have the orange particles and the whitish particles. What are they made of? They're made of PE, an abrasive, which is in the product to remove dead skin and thereby improve the appearance of the skin. What's PE? Polyethylene. Plastic? Yes, plastic. The R&D department is now searching for compounds to replace the plastic. I'm trying an alternative peeling particle. Silica is silicon dioxide. It's comparable to sand. It's dyed blue here. In diesem Fall ist es blau eingefärbt, was man hier sehen kann. What would happen is that the silica particles would sink to the bottom. We have to make the product stable. We have to add a frame within the shower gel to support the particles and prevent that from happening. Most Unilever products in Germany, Austria and Switzerland don't contain any microplastics anymore. But the company is still using them in other countries. What's the reason they got out? Public pressure? We just thought it's being talked about a lot these days. We weighed everything up and thought we'd get out. We're developing products that are using other environmentally friendly particles. It remains to be seen whether other companies will follow Unilever's example. There are lots of announcements, but there's no legal obligation. According to politicians, the knowledge base is too uncertain. The International Conference on Prevention and Management of Marine Litter in European Seas was held in Berlin in April 2013. The German Minister of the Environment at the time, Peter Altmaier, was unequivocal about his determination to act against the plastic waste problem. There is an enormous degree of urgency. We cannot wait until 2025. 
we need uh, political action and uh, concrete results uh, much uh, earlier. Thank you so much. Fine words, but no concrete measures. Gerd Lieberzeit had hoped for more. <coughs> to this day, the German government still rejects the ban on microplastics in cosmetics that many demand. They're in unison with the plastics lobby. To regional action, to national measures, and to the EU quantitative reduction targets under development. I'm very happy with the conference. The topic was discussed extensively and rationally, and the participants avoided mere headline politics, so we've all made good progress. Gat Liebertzeit from the University of Oldenburg believes the government's inaction is a big mistake. He's on his way to take water samples, not on the open water, but right in front of a small canal. It's the sewage pipe of the Wilhelmshaven sewage treatment plant, which lies a few kilometers further inland. These small particles measure 100 micrometers or less. They're not fully removed. Some stay in the sewage sludge. But we don't know the quantities or how much ends up in the sea. This is true of all sewage treatment plants. All sewage treatment plants release plastic particles in their effluent. They do damage in the water in two ways. One is that a lot of particles release plasticizers which impact animals like hormones. It's because of substances like these that some marine mollusks have gone extinct, because the females mutated into males. Reproduction became impossible. It's believed that plasticizers also cause infertility in humans. In addition, the surface of the plastics attracts toxins. The particles gather pollutants like miniature hazardous waste transporters. So, and when yet an organism when an organism like a saltwater mollusk takes in these contaminated plastic particles, then the chemical milieu changes in the gastrointestinal tract and the toxins can be released. They enter the flesh. That's a secondary contamination, and that can spread throughout the food chain. What the professor has found at the mouth of the Weser could also be a problem at sea. The Alexander von Humboldt II is just arriving in the port of Heligoland. This vessel will, it's hoped, help answer the question about the concentration of microplastics in the ocean. The boat has an osmosis facility on board which turns salt water into fresh water. This facility includes fine filters. Martin Loder from the Alfred Wegener Institute is hoping they could help in the search for microplastics. He's meeting the senior engineer on board. Osmosis facilities like this one have to filter a lot of water. That's why we're hoping to look in the range of 80 micrometers down to 10 micrometers to see how much plastic is in the water. It's completely uncharted territory. There'll definitely be more than just the large particles that have been examined to date. The men are on their way to the engine room. This is the filtration system. They're taking the first samples. 
Es ist drucklos, wir werden also nicht nass gespritzt. Ja, das wäre schön. Ja. Wasser ist natürlich dabei. So. Aber das ist eben jetzt eine besagte Kerze. Aha. Microfilters can filter particles down to a size of a hundredth of a millimeter. What's interesting is what you don't see with the naked eye. This is the filter we'll analyze. It takes a few days to prepare the sample. First, the filter from the Alexander von Humboldt II has to be thoroughly rinsed. The greenish-brown liquid is what the sailboat filtered out of 30 cubic meters of seawater. The liquid is filtered again and then examined under an infrared spectroscope. That's the only way plastic particles can be distinguished for certain from other things. Things that wouldn't be detectable under a microscope are lit up in green on the screen. Plastic particles, the smallest ones just a few thousandths of a millimeter in size. Na, wie sieht's aus? Ja, ganz schön was drin. And they find quite a bit. Most of the plastic they find is polypropylene and polyethylene. They're surprised by how much they found. The sample also contains fibers. So far, we've only looked at the larger particles, which we removed by hand. Now we found that there's a large quantity of microplastics in the North Sea and the Baltic. I don't want to say how much, but definitely more than I expected. The question now is whether the plastic has already found its way into our food chain. To find that out, the scientists scatter fine plastic granules into a sea salt solution. These particles fluoresce under UV light. Then they release tiny copepods into the water. They're on the lowest link of the food chain. Some crustaceans are actually able to avoid indigestible substances. We'll soon see whether the copepods think the layer of microplastics is palatable or not. What's really fascinating and bad news is that the cope pods really ate it. The experiment was a complete success. We've been able to prove our results, but it's still bad news. The plastic can enter the food chain via these crustaceans. In the basement of the Alfred Wegener Institute, the scientists are also investigating the question whether plastic can degrade in the oceans. Definitely over time, in two years. We'll see. I'm particularly interested to see when the bioplastics start degrading. We want to see whether the different types of plastics degrade in seawater. Microbiologists are always interested to see what biofilms occur, what organisms are involved in degrading the polymers. This plastic is biodegradable. We should have good decomposition within three to four months. It won't be gone completely, but it should be less. If bioplastics degrade quickly in water, that could be helpful for even the most remote corners of our oceans. The Alfred Wegener Institute is researching the deep sea habitat in the Arctic using remote controlled cameras. They deliver footage from depths of down to 5,500 meters. The evaluation confirms a dramatic development. Marine biologist Melanie Baumann discovers rubbish particles in the footage. She's already evaluated more than 3,000 images. Here's a piece of styrofoam and a rubber band. That's a bottle, probably a beer bottle. 
The amount of rubbish found doubled between 2002 and 2011. As in the North Sea, the shipping and fishing industries are considered to be the culprits. The cod is going further and further north, which attracts fishermen. And because of the decline in ice, more and more fishing vessels and private yachts are happy to go further north. Into waters they wouldn't previously have entered. That means shipping has worsened the rubbish problem in the Arctic. Scientists have proved that this source is also the main cause of the rubbish in the North Sea. The German Ministry of the Environment has a very different opinion. The majority of the rubbish doesn't come from shipping, but from land. That's the answer to our request. And yet the results of decades of rubbish research on Mellum show that shipping appears to be one of the main sources of rubbish in the North Sea. It's highly probable that the vast majority, more than 90% of our rubbish comes from shipping in the North Sea. When we have fragments of nets, they can only have come from fishing, while the rest can come from any kind of ship. MARPOL, the International Convention for the Prevention of Pollution from Ships, prohibits the disposal of plastic waste at sea. But the authorities would have to witness someone throwing plastic rubbish into the sea before they can take action. How effectively can such an environmental agreement be enforced? This question takes us to Hamburg Harbour. They're here to monitor whether the MARPOL regulations are being adhered to. Bjorn Boyser and Torsten Vorbel work for the Hamburg Water Police. They're conducting an unannounced inspection. You're here for a Marpol inspection. Okay. They're supposed to make sure ships get rid of their rubbish while they're docked. The officers will inspect all of the rooms in which rubbish is collected. Rubbish is separated on board too, but who can tell where that rubbish ultimately ends up? Okay. The rubbish diary is of more interest. The crew have to document when and where they discard rubbish. The officers compare this data to the disposal receipts. The domestic rubbish has to be disposed of ashore, or it could be burned on board. There need to be disposal receipts in the ports, and that should have happened regularly. We're doing a cross-check. The vessels need those receipts. Everything seems okay here, but there are black sheep. Sometimes the officers find inconsistencies in the documents. If I see that they didn't get rid of food waste for three months, and I don't find evidence of other domestic waste such as incinerator ash or fat, and they disposed of just half a cubic meter in Hamburg, then I'd have to accuse the crew of having disposed of garbage illegally or of not keeping proper records. Can you prove anything? I can't prove anything because I wasn't on board. That's the problem. That's why penalties are rare. The water police conducted 14,000 inspections in 2011 and fines were only issued in 100 cases. In theory, fines of up to 50,000 euros could be imposed, but in reality, the average fine was just 257 euros. Why is so much rubbish still thrown into the sea instead of being disposed of properly in port? There have been men in Hamburg that pick up the rubbish from the ships. The problem is that disposing of waste incurs costs. In Hamburg, only one cubic metre of garbage is included in the port fees. That corresponds to one sack, like this. Every further sack costs around 150 euros. That can quickly turn into a thousand. 
That money can be saved by disposing of the rubbish illegally. But it doesn't have to be this way, and that's demonstrated by most of the Baltic ports, which have stopped charging extra for waste disposal. As a result, illegal dumping has decreased significantly. That's why environmental organizations have been hugely in favor of the no special fee system. The disposal of all waste is part of the harbor fee. And because it doesn't cost extra, the motivation to dispose of rubbish at sea illegally is gone. This system isn't used on the North Sea or other European North Sea ports because they're all in competition with each other. They're all waiting for a European solution. We've been told by German ports that they won't introduce such measures unless Rotterdam or Antwerp do the same. But the free disposal of rubbish in ports isn't an issue for the relevant EU Commission for Mobility. It wants more competition between ports. The German Ministry for Transport also has nothing to say about the issue and refers us to the individual state governments. Eight months later, we're back on Heligoland. We want to know how the long-term experiment at the Alfred Wegener Institute has panned out. Have the marine organisms really started decomposing plastic? How has the bioplastic fared? They look different. There's a big biofilm buildup. At the moment, we see no change. You can see that a biofilm has formed on the plastic. That's this brown thing that you can see. But on the macroscopic level, there are no holes. We would have expected some small holes, at least in the bioplastics. Bioplastics don't seem to be a solution. We're left with trying to avoid plastic waste and cosmetics containing microplastics. One thing is clear. Plastic exists everywhere in the sea. It's becoming smaller and smaller and therefore more and more dangerous because it's become part of the food chain.